Sonali, can we ask if you can see this us? This meeting or... is being recorded. Just a second. Just a second. Yeah. Okay, a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us for our Saturday live talks, which are Saturday vibes. And of course, some are vibing in the afternoon, in the morning and in the night, but we're all connected through this little window called Zoom, which has changed our lives while the earth itself is changing. So today we have the, what do I say, the very inspirational Ed Douglas, as he talks about the Himalayas, his journey and his bestseller, which is right next to me, Himalaya, a human history. Can you see it? Oh God, I've got this. Uh, you can see a fragment of it, I think. Himalaya. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so who is Ed? Well, he is this amazing author who is an award-winning journalist, author of 13 books about mountains and their people, including the first full-length biography of Tenzing Norgay, who climbed Everest with Sir Edmund Hillary in 1953. Uh, Ed has covered the Nepali Civil War for the Observer and National Geographic, has interviewed the Dalai Lama for The Guardian. And of course, we really need to interview him again of all that is going on with dear Dalai Lama right now. And made over 40 visits to the Himalayas, including a dozen mountaineering expeditions. Ed is a regular contributor to the radio and television and was a consultant on the BAFTA-nominated film Sherpa. He's a contributor to The Guardian for 30 long years writes a column for the paper's country diary. And today in the present, he lives in Sheffield with his wife, Kate, a science editor. So we are so happy to welcome you, Ed. And I'm so um, grateful to you for agreeing to do this because it is so important. It is so important for everybody to read your book and to know what is going on with the mountains we love so dearly and its past and its future. Uh, today, um, Myself and Siddharth Pandey, who uh, is the next round of introductions. Siddharth is a dear friend who has uh, talked uh, on our forum. And this forum is for everyone, basically, whoever gets connected to us. Uh, Siddharth belongs to Shimla and has a PhD in English and Materiality Studies from the University of Cambridge. He's currently a fellow at the Kate Hamburger Center for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, Munich, where he's researching in the Indian Himalayas through the lenses of ecological aesthetics and dwelling perspectives. He has held fellowships and grants in global history, art history, colonial history, and global travel cultures under the ages of LMU Center for Global History, Yale Center for British Art, Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, and the Charles Wallace India Trust. And I would like to add being a part of the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies in India as well. His own research interests include Himalayan studies, environmental humanities, material studies, fantasy literature, children's literature, nature, travel writing, craft, folk studies, and popular culture. And um, it's so important. I, I really wanted to Siddharth, Siddharth to be, you know, asking questions today on the panel because his book, his first book published in 2021 by the Tasmania based artistic platform. Um, a published event explored the Himalayas through a geomythological poetic lens, which was so beautiful, writ beautifully written. Uh, and I really hope, uh, Siddharth, you can guide Ed to that book because I'm sure Ed will love it. The book called Thank Fossil, you. which we launched, you know, with the with Hicks. So um, that's that about uh, Himalayas. Of course, his photography is also wonderful and has been um, shown in very, very wonderful places. And um, I, Ed, you already know, and people who are here know me as well. So I'm Sonali, I'm an anthropological archeologist. Currently I'm a cultural resource specialist and uh, an architectural historian based in LA. Well, I was teaching in UCLA for a long time. And uh, I take great pride in being um, a part of the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies. You tell me in the middle of the night to wake up and do something, for the Himalaya, I'll be right there. So that's my introduction. And today, over to Ed about Himalaya, a human history, where it all started, how it started. And we'll intersperse these conversations with our questions, Ed. 
so that you don't feel like you're talking to a blank wall. But we are all listening in because all that you have to say is so important. So let's start with your childhood and your tryst with oh, the <laughs> my childhood uh, is remarkably uninteresting um but for the for the purposes of talking to you um uh i started climbing i tell you what when i was about four or five as a child on the wall of my parents living room was a picasso uh from he did a series of paintings about uh, a gymnast and um i was obsessed with this painting and not because of the subject, which was a, a boy and a man or, uh, balancing on a stones, but because of the landscape. It was a very austere landscape. And I was most interested in the landscape. And then when I was six or seven, I started hill walking in Brit British mountains in the Lake District, where the Wordsworth and all those poets come from. And I basically fell in love as a child with these landscapes. I just found them very other because I was living in the English city of Birmingham, which is in a suburb of Birmingham, very urban, very kind of built up, really quite boring. And these landscapes were very exciting. So that that is the origin of my interest in mountains, purely romantic. And then when I was a teenager, I started climbing. I got into the culture of climbing. So... You know, my heroes were people like Chris Bonington, um, who's climbed a lot in the Himalaya. And uh, I became obsessed it, to, to, to the extent that it distracted me from having a meaningful career. Um, and of course, the ultimate thing to do was to go to the Himalaya, um, because those were, that's where the biggest mountains were. Um, it took me bit longer than it should have done because for much of my life I had a fear of flying so I couldn't get on an airplane but um, a newspaper I started I went to university spent too much climbing and I did the pretty much the only thing you can do when you um, get dragged away from having a proper academic life and that's become a journalist <laughs> because I have a short attention span so that's what I did I became a journalist newspaper heard about my fear of flying was doing a special thing on phobias. So they sent me on a fear of flying course and it worked. And about three weeks later, I was on my way to the Himalaya because that's and, where I wanted to go. And thank God it worked. And you got- I know, I know. Well, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> it's it a boon, great deal boon of pleasure for all of us. But that was 30, yeah, yeah, that was 30 years ago. Wow. So I, I, went, to, uh, I went to Nepal first and um, I immediately felt very at home. It's not my home, you know, it's your home, it's not my home. But I felt very welcome, I felt very happy. I felt, uh, but overwhelmingly, I felt curious. And um, uh, my instinct when I feel curious is to get a book. And, um, when, and I thought what I want is an introduction to the, to, to the Himalaya, you know, its history and its complexities. And there simply wasn't one. And about 25 years later, there still wasn't one, really. Not for people who understand the region. You know, there's a huge amount of scholarship about the Himalayan region. There's all sorts of Himalayan writers who are really interesting on the Himalaya. But I'm coming from a Western perspective. And I, I had this uh, kind of um, dissonance between my experiences of the Himalaya, which, you know, I, I came, I've, I've come every year, sometimes twice a year, and often for long periods of time. So, you know, this is a long period. Between the kind of popular perception of the Himalaya, which brought me there in the first place, you know, I was as naive and foolish as anybody, and the actual reality, which is very different. Um, with kind of echoes of, of of the things that brought me in the first place. So that that's that's the space that I wanted to explore, really, for the benefit of people who might follow me. That's yeah. it. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, when you started talking about how, you know, climbing was the first thing, um, of course, the pictures that kind of inspired you. and And this has always been my thing as well. 
that people focus a lot on the climbing, the mountaineering, and um, yep. the culture kind of gets, um, you know, a secondary treatment. But actually, when yes. you when you enter that domain and the culture kind of builds on you, and um, this has always been that, that disconnect. And I told you we are starting our Himalayan Conservation and Preservation Society precisely to bring the two together and tell people how important it is. So I, I do, uh, your first chapter talks about this a lot. Uh, you know, in 1995, when you first came, um, you talked about India, uh, yeah. Yeah. the rain. And I, I want you to talk a little bit about, you know, your experience hitting that culture right deep. And, and how did it, change your perspective or added on to what you didn't really know before you had just read and talked about the mountains, you know, from a very, uh, very Western perspective, but now you're in the thick of things. How, how does that affect you? How does that change you? Uh, well, it changed me very quickly. And I, I have to say, I, my first trip to India, I mean, I'd been to Nepal a couple of times, a couple of in the previous years. And then I came to India and the first, the first, place I went was Gangotri, which is the perfect place to go, really, you know, to go to Gaumuk and um, to climb Shivling. And um, climbing Shivling was great. But, um, you know, the whole experience of being a Tapavan, you know, the, uh, there was a guy there, you know, like the, uh, there was a sadhu there, and, you know, there was a, a, a guy called Omgiri. And, um, you know, there was the, the temple in Gangotri, all of this why, for instance, was it a Nepali general who had built the temple in Gangotri? Do you know what I mean? That, like, why was that? Why was I meeting Nepalis in, in you know, working as porters? You know, how, how could that be? I had this very fixed idea of national boundaries. And um, so, and I was very conscious of the British Empire. It didn't occur to me that there would be such a thing as the Gokali Empire. Um, and that there would be, you know, a whole range of um, intersecting worlds, polities, peoples. Um, and uh, to be honest, it was a little overwhelming because, you know, it was uh, so complicated. And that complexity uh, really drew me in, actually, um, because, I, you know, there's a direct relationship between the geography and the, and the complexity, if you see what I mean. Mountains are always complicated places culturally because geography has sets, sets much greater limits. And um, that makes for, you know, a really interesting place. But it's, it's a complexity that's often ignored by people on the plains because, you know, mountains are other. <laughs> right. and, um, it, and it's easy to miss that. And also mountains are regarded as kind of physically difficult places. And if they're physically difficult, then they can't be culturally rich. You know, they can't be sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And that's patently nonsense. So, yeah, um, yeah you're right. Yeah. That's the mindset of the people. And I, I want to, uh, you know, um, like after me, uh, Siddharth can take over um, the questions. But um, one thing that you talked about, you know, this, uh, why the Nepali journals? And I was, uh, in my own experience as well, I've noticed, you know, for example, in the Kulu Valley, we do know, that there were Buddhist uh, temples, there were more monasteries there. Uh, we have, uh, you know, extracts um, coming out from the, uh, the travels of Hyun Sang, who talks about the Kulu Valley having more monasteries than temples. And even today, those Hindu temples have Bodhisattva images, but nobody questions it. You know, a few scholars have tried to address that. You talk about the Puranic uh, uh, text, the Manas Khand, and you talk about the mythical association, which I kind of changes and becomes a version of white text. And I see that happening in the narrative that people have in uh, core areas that I have worked on, where uh, a typical Shiva temple, which has been camouflaged and uh, changed into a version of white temple, and people have forgotten about its history. And when I tell them, you know, these are images from a Shiva temple, they are amorous couples, and this cannot be in a version of white temple. And they just get upset. And as you go away from that core, the story is alive. But in that core, the narrative is different. And I see that, you know, how you address the Manas Khand with the Garhwal and the Kumau leaning. So if you could talk a little bit about that, you could tell our audience today about um, what you kind of uh, unveiled with, the, you know, the politics happening mixed with the myth making, which is also changing the focus that is so important for people to know that. 
Well, I, I think so. And and it's kind of you to say that I unveiled these things. I mean, I to be honest with you, I've unveiled nothing. It's all there. Other people have done the heavy lifting. You know, I have tremendous respect for the anthropologists and um, archaeologists and sort of cultural historians and spirit, you know, uh, religious uh, studies um, scholars who who have unpicked all of these layers. Um, and the story they tell is uh, a sort of very pertinent one, I think, especially at the moment in India. Um, I don't wish to cause anybody alarm, but, um, you know, it, it is, it's, a, it's an often unnerving picture at the moment, which kind of does not allow much space for uh, the complexities of Indian history. Uh, you know, that the um, Kulu and, 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 you know, that end of the Himalaya um, was, you know, a thousand years ago was a hotbed of kind of, of a Buddhist Renaissance. And um, meeting, meeting at the same time a kind of resurgent Hinduism. I mean, you know, in in in, in a period of, of a few centuries, around a thousand AD, on either side, you know, um, and um, you know the 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 art that that period produced is absolutely mes mesmerizing. I mean, one of the pleasures of my life was going to Alchi in in Ladakh and seeing the imagery there, you know, done by Kashmiri um, artisans. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that Kashmir is Buddhist past. Uh, I mean, you have to scrape hard these days to <laughs> get anybody to acknowledge it or, or, or get much evidence of it. But I mean, you know, Kashmir was a, a hotbed of um, Buddhist art and, and, and a hotbed of Buddhist philosophy and thought and, and practice. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the consequences of this big strong Tibetan polity in, in the center of this you know there's a reason that you know people in Baltistan are comprehensible to a Sherpa from Kumbu you know <laughs> is, is because of this great strength of the Tibetan Empire you know uh, 1300 years ago and it has had long-term cultural consequences um, and, and rather beautiful ones I think I like this multiplicity of traditions meeting together in the Himalaya. Um, and I, I think uh, people do find it challenging. I mean, the modern media is all pervasive. In, you know, that, that's, that's a consequence of changes. You know, we have Zoom, it's great, but it, it's a consequence of changes in the way that we communicate with each other. It's affected the media. I've seen it in my own professional life. It's changed the nature of the media. It's much more intense, much more pervasive, and it's much more competitive. So the extremes that people go to uh, to get attention now, um, and attention is money, um, has, I think, radicalized all of us, not, not just in India, all over the world, in Britain especially. You know, we've just suffered the catastrophe of Brexit, and some of that was driven by very much, you know, failing to understand your historical roots. Mm -hmm. The same is true in the Himalayan region. Uh, you know, people are, are tuned into um, very strong messages coming from their mainstream media. Let's put it like that. <laughs> yeah. And very little challenge, very little pushback from the truth, which is that, you know, you have you know, Buddhism and Hinduism and, and, and um, both, both of you know, both sides of the Himalaya, if you like, have seen centuries of sectarian struggle, um, often violent sectarian struggle. And, um, but at the same time, a kind of spiritual synthesis, which is, which varies from place to place, but has a kind of overarching harmony, I think, which is remarkable. Right. And I like the fact that uh, in your first chapter itself, you write about the two contrasting roles uh, of the Himalaya as a spiritual retreat and separation from the world and a meeting ground of different cultures who traded. So this whole idea of it being totally, you know, out there, but also a place for the wild. So, um, 
And uh, before Siddharth asks his question, I want to um, read out the very first um, um, line that you wrote on your first chapter in Pilgrims, because it's so beautiful, where the earth asked Vishnu, why do you come in the form of mountains and not in your own form? And Vishnu replied, the pleasure that exists in mountains is greater than that of animate beings, for they feel no heat, no cold, no pain, no anger, no fear, no pleasure. We three gods as mountains will reside in the earth for the benefit of mankind. So I think so we've forgotten that the benefit of mankind. <laughs> We're just like, you know. Yes, no, I agree with you. And <laughs> I, I put that in. I feel this very strongly because I, I often, you know, I've often thought about what is the appeal of mountains to me? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not, you know, from the Himalaya or, and I'm not from the mountains. You know, like I said, I grew up in, in, a, in England's second city. Uh, and I think what it is, is psychological space. Um, you can find more psychological space in the mountains. There is less, you know, the narratives of other people are less pressing upon you. Mm -hmm. And that is very liberating. That's a sense of freedom, which is extremely powerful. And also, I think the role nature plays in our lives. Um, is uh, very important. I think people need access to nature in some shape or form. And so the Himalaya has in abundance both, you know, it has the most astonishing uh, sort of natural appeal. And at the same time, this kind of, this great liberation, this great psychological liberation, which tends to drive people towards the spiritual, I think. I think they feel themselves remade when they go in a very powerful way. And I, uh, I mean, you can call it what you like, your religion or spirituality, whatever. But I think at a fundamental human level, it's a kind of psychological sense of freedom. Right. So true. Siddharth, over to you. Hi, Ed. Uh, can you see me? And can you see I can. Me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so good to be here. Thank you again, Sonali, for having me here. Uh, it's an incredible honor and a pleasure to be conversing with Ed. Thank you, Ed, for your absolutely stunning, glorious, brilliant mammoth of a book, I would say. <laughs> uh, which, has been, a <laughs> <laughs> which has been, uh, in all good ways, uh, in a very, very overwhelming experience. I mean, it's just, uh, and not only for the sheer complexity of it, but also for the sheer length of it, I have not come across something so incredibly detailed. So, Thank you. Thank you for all the effort that you have put into it. And I think it would definitely serve as an incredibly valuable piece of information, study, history, writing, everything for, for future generations. So thank you for this. And, and thanks also for, for you know, making this uh, a little, starting off with this little biographical note about your childhood and about your paintings, uh, about the paintings that you saw, which is something that also uh, structurally speaking, because I'm a literary scholar first and then a cultural historian I would say um, I was quite enchanted like in one of the first few chapters you do start with one or two paintings I think and, and also uh, a couple of discussions on architecture especially Nevadi architecture so I felt that emphasis on the the material as as a source of you know culture very very interesting and very very compelling as well I do have a couple of a uh, couple of questions here but I do also want to acknowledge that one other point that you said in response to, I think, Sonali's second question about this, this sort of contradictoriness or contradiction, which is, I guess, at the heart of all cultures. But also, I mean, it speaks very much voluminously in the case of the Himalayas, where you have the synthesis, but you also have the political tensions going back to hundreds and thousands of years, as you show very beautifully in your, in your work. And that is something that I find um, in my work, I'm more of a creative writer. So when I started researching mythology and Hindu mythology, especially in for, for my work, it was, it became very apparent to me that there was never, I mean, within the context of India itself, the same mythology has innumerable variations. So for instance, we all know that the Mahabharata has 100 Kauravas and five Pandavas, but there are so many version of the Mahabharata in the Himachal Himalayas and Uttarakhand Himalayas, where the number of Kauravas are just 60, mm -hmm. which is just such a, you know, a, a brilliant sort of a, what should I say, a, a, a sort of a different take on the number itself. And there are many, many more uh, notions and uh, many more differences as well. So thank you for bringing that out. 
the so let me begin with so the first question i think somewhere in the in chapter 6 the rise of the gurkha you make this very beautiful statement and i'll just quote you here that uh, we tend to see cultures as accreting like sedimentary rocks but in reality they metamorphose under the pressure to conform to the demands of the world ar- around them mm. and i i really feel that that sort of um captures the whole heart and whole argument of the of the book itself that instead of thinking about cultures as a creating we need to think about them as as metamorphosis would you like to say something about it uh-huh. one or two examples? i would i mean I, what i was trying to do is get a very complicated idea in as neat a package as i could mm-hmm. because i barely understand it myself but i think there is a tendency to when you start picking apart the the cultural changes through history of a particular region that you say okay so it was like this in 1350 and it was like this in 1550 and it was like this in 17 1750 but that's not how it really works yeah, yeah. do you know what i mean because stuff from way back then can suddenly you i mean you know there are arguments about whether or not there was a mosque at a certain place and suddenly something from way back over here has been reheated and pressurized and changed into something else but but thoroughly connected with the past but in very current very now very important very relevant to people's lives in 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 the day to day now and and that's the point i'm trying to get you know somebody i can't trying to remember who it was you know the past it is never really past you know i mean it's uh, it's not history it's 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 not even the past i mean it's 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 always with us but it gets changed and warped and shifts and our imaginations go to work on it and we're not actually always overly concerned about accuracy yeah. we'd like to select the little bits that make sense to us in our current situation and use those as arguments for our own perspective if you like yeah. i mean history is really i mean my definition of history is the acquisition and management of resources by people of similar narrative with sharing a similar narrative yeah. and you you know that narrative can broaden and contract and it can grab things from the past and and wear them as fresh clothes you know i mean it's it's Mm-hmm. it's not it's not a kind of exact science mm-hmm. and politicians you know politicians do that all the time we were talking about this my wife and i were talking about this the other day is that um statues yeah. you know statues are really interesting things but by and large only when they're being put up or taken down <laughs> when they're up nobody looks at them yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, If people start looking at statues it's usually because they've got a mind to remove them. <laughs> and in one of your chapters you do actually begin with statues right? Yes. One of the Nepali king statues being put up again during the Maoist regime I think and that causing a lot of problems or different That's right. Opinions, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And you have you know you have politicians of very similar political outlooks. Yeah. Yeah. One lot pulling them down and the other lot trying to re- replace them. Mm. But it it you know it's so that statue that that image of uh, Prithvi Narayan Shah is so fundamental to Nepali identity that 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 is very difficult to live without it but at the same time it embodies essentially um domination a colonial history uh kind of repression of ethnic minorities all of these things so it's a, it's a very problematic image yeah no, no sorry. sorry go ahead yeah go good ahead. good I just wanted to you know with this association with uh, Nepal Nevari culture also like in in Kulu Kulu especially especially in the you know there was this uh, wonderful uh, paper written by a scholar um, I'm forgetting his name but uh, he was in Tel Aviv University and he was trying to make a connect with um, uh, the Nevari culture of uh, sacrifice uh, and uh, the Malana um, uh, there was this ritual where the nar and the nora were sacrificed and it kind of went down to the kullu valley as well but the orientation kind of changed and there's so much of a nepali influence in that whole ritual which is kind of uh, uh, 
it is not like focused on at all uh and just like what you are saying about how these things uh everything is just um changed uh, because of the politics and uh, all of that and one group gets uh, uh, segregated and uh, the minorities get pushed back and their history gets pushed back so just wanted to bring that yes in. to the extent that to the extent that they forget their own history which is um i, I remember yeah. being in uh in Simicot, um in in humla in right in, in i mean there is a corner of the himalaya which because it you know because it fell on the wrong side of the border if you like and and there was no real affection for it coming from Kathmandu uh, remained an extremely poor it remains a very uh, extremely poor region with a very glorious past and um i i was there at a wedding um and seeing things you know which kind of you sort of straight out of a rajput playbook and they had no conception of like why they were doing these these things in, involving swords and and kind of parades and people being soaked with various liquids and but but it but they that's what they did you know it was that that would that was part of the part of who they were so um yeah i i do think that that often you find these fossils up these cultural fossils high in himalayan valleys of things which have disappeared centuries before um from their origin and um that was very much uh uh the sort of it's very interesting the himalaya you were talking about the climbers before um, and and the, the kind of interest in mountaineering in the west the big problem in understanding the himalaya one of them i think which is not something i've written about is um the, the anthropologists got their second so the explorers got their first is often the way and then the mountaineers came and all these myths started building and then the anthropologists turned up <laughs> just a bit too late to to really be able to get the narrative sorted if you see what i mean so when people like giuseppe tucci turn up um they discover essentially a kind of tantric in kathmandu they discover a tantric world that has disappeared from the rest of northern india from the you know from the rest of the northern subcontinent several centuries before i mean like hundreds of years before and that this extraordinary it's like a living Pompeii almost, you know, you suddenly you're thrown back into ancient Rome or something and you get to see it for real. Yeah. So that I think um, is really magical. You know, you, you, it's, it makes it such a joy. I mean, and, and it's, you kind of fear that a lot of it is already slipping away very quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, yeah. So. And incidentally, I'm teaching a course on Tantra in the Western Himalayas next week. I, I, I have right. structured this online course on Tantra, which is, um, okay. uh, yeah. I love teaching that. Over to you, Siddharth. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank, thank you for, for that complex, uh, uh, you know, answer uh, to my to my first question. And I mean, because you mentioned those those travelers who discovered these old rituals in in Nepal. One of the things that I was wondering was about you know uh, about the title of your book and also the scope of your book and on which I would like to sort of you know pose one or two I mean complex questions or at least detailed questions so in um, I've been a part of I've been a fellow of um, the Center of Global History here at uh, the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich a couple of years ago and now I'm uh, um, and now I'm a fellow at the same uh, at the same university but with a different center and this so uh, in academia at least um, this field called global history is kind of one to two decades old. It's still sort of forming. And it's very interesting that most of the uh, historians and most of the theorization that has taken on the field of global history has actually, um, I mean, most of the discussions or examples that are you know, taken as, a, as, a, as an illustration of, of this particular field actually come from the oceanic world or the world of sea and not from water. So they are almost 90% of the examples that you will find of oceanic, sorry, of global histories would actually be of, you know, concerned with some sort of a water sources. Mm -hmm. And the reason is simple because when you see the map of a world, you see all the oceans flowing into each other and water flowing into each other, which then raises the question. And I was having this discussion with a couple of my professors here and co-fellows as well, that is it not possible to write a, a global history of mountains? And obviously the idea of mountains gives rise to and the existence and ontology of mountains is obviously 
much more um, intricate, varied, scale-wise, breadth-wise, et cetera, et cetera. But on reading your book, um, it's called, it's simply titled Himalaya uh, Human History. The I kept sort of coming across the fact that this is, you're talking about one region, a kind of a pan-Asian or at least pan-South Asian region. And I, I couldn't sort of help think of it as very much a global history. I mean, the innumerable references that you put in here, the, the Jesuit missionaries, the knowledge of Christianity in Tibet before the knowledge of Buddhism, um, the, the, uh, the, the you know, uh, Islamic travelers as well, and the interface of Hinduism and Buddhism. I mean, it was just the, the sheer sort of network of innumerable identities from all across the world that you sort of bring together and focus on within this particular region uh, completely sort of made me feel that this this is literally a global history of the Himalayas. Even yes, as yeah. 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 It's, it's funny you should mention the oceans. I just, on my desk at the moment is this book by uh, called The Boundless Sea. I don't know whether you can see that. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can. David Abulaf. Abu Lafia, I'm not quite sure how you say his name. He's like a he's a historian of the of the history of the oceans. Yeah. It's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fourteen hundred pages, as well. <laughs> but it, but, but we, um, you know, you're absolutely right. But and and I think, um, you know, we focus on you, you, we do focus on the oceans um, for good reason, mm -hmm. but it isn't the water bit, except. Mm -hmm in a practical sense, because it's easier for most of human history, it's easier to go by sea than to go by land. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the journeys people have been making by sea for millennia are quite extraordinary. Yeah. What's important is the exchange of knowledge. Mm. And that's the key bit. You know, humans have theory of, you know, have theory of mind. I know that you're thinking, <laughs> you know, I know you, you know, orders of intentionality. I know that you know that I know that you know that this thing is bad. Do, do you see what I mean? It's, yeah. we are complicated animals. And um, we're also incredibly inventive. And if we're smart, we try not to fight each other, literally. And we focus on what we can learn from other people and absorb into our own kind of technological habits to our advantage. So that exchange of understanding knowledge, technologies, all, you know, crops, um, farming techniques, all of this stuff yeah. is, is the key principle behind that and not the actual being on a boat bit. So if you imagine Central Asia as a vast brown ocean, then it makes a lot more sense, right? I mean, Peter Frankopan obviously yeah. talks a lot about the Silk Roads. Yeah. And, you know, that has been, the Silk Roads have been all, clearly been one of the major drivers of history for all kinds of things from, you know, disease to slaves to ideas to religion to all of it. What's yeah. interesting about the Himalayan region for me is, the, is its altitude. Altitude is a really complicated thing. And I, and I often think of the Himalaya as kind of like a ship's prow, you know, the, the world's information highway, which is the Silk Roads, break around the Himalaya because occupying it is really expensive. Yeah. It's often the case in, in world history that colonializing powers resist the temptation of moving into mountains unless there's a bloody good reason for going there. Because it, you know, the British in, in, in Nepal in, in the start of the 19th century looked at Nepal and thought trade. Mm. Then they fought the Nepalis and thought, actually, do you know what? There isn't enough here for us to take this on because it's too hard. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the reward for the, you know, it was the most expensive, when we invaded um, Nepal, it was the most expensive war we'd yet fought in India. Yeah. And the rewards weren't worth it. And at that point, the British decided 
what we want from Nepal is its people. So we'll just lock it off and leave it alone and take what we, you know, I mean, the, um, um, that, that's essentially what happened. And I think that's that's been true throughout history from, from most people who came, you know, uh, into the Himalaya. They didn't stay. China didn't stay. China only really stayed um, when it sort of in the modern era with the, with the Chinese Communist Party, sort of rebuilding and possibly misunderstanding kind of Qing uh, foreign policy. Um, but before that, you know, the, China was one to bet kind of locked up, safe, but not, we're not putting too much money in it. Because, you know, the war they fought, which was, you know, just before the war the British fought, was also hugely expensive without the kind of, justifiable rewards yeah. um but the i mean altitude is in a sense even more interesting than that because it required um a lot of evolution to make it viable which is why it's so fascinating and um i mean that's you know since the book came out there's been more work done more genetic work done on um the links between Denisovan and Homo sapiens, which gave Tibetans these key genetic adaptations to altitude, mm. uh, which made which left them able to prosper in a place where, you know, Chinese or English or anybody else can't so readily, um, which is which does make does make it a very special place. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. into academically but also literally absolutely uh, no completely yeah yes Sonali. yeah so ed if you could talk a little bit about mapping the himalayas because it was such a herculean task that was taken up and uh, you know the breadth uh, the length and breadth that uh, you know uh, the so-called colonizers and this uh, uh, also their personal passions you know into uh, unveiling and understanding this humongous landscape uh, that they see uh, if you could, you know, tell our viewers a little bit about that, because uh, not many know about uh, the complexity of the mapping of the Himalaya, you know. Okay. How... Yeah, you're talking about the, the great uh, trigonometrical yeah, survey. Yeah, and, the survey. Uh, the great yeah. arc. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I, mapping is really important. Um, uh, maps are uh, sort of cultural artifacts as well as useful. Mm -hmm. And um, we, the Himalaya is often presented to us as a blank on the map. You know, it's it's a it's a unwritten piece of on piece of paper that we can go and you know fill. <laughs> um, and it was always just nonsense because, first of all, Himalayan peoples are great travelers because they need to be. That you know, it's often you're practicing nomadism or transhumance or or your trading and uh tibetans especially love to travel you know you come across endless examples of tibetan scholars uh, religious leaders traders whoever who have traveled all over not just within tibet but you know within the region and understood the geography of their place very well um and of course in the 18th century there were these amazing mapping journeys um, commissioned by Jesuit missionaries in China, but carried out by um, uh, Tibetans um, working on their behalf. And actually the maps they produce, pretty good, really. But um, obviously, the of new mapping techniques in Europe um, as a consequence of the Enlightenment. Um, so really starting end of the 18th century, so early 19th century, uh, um, which were then brought to India by uh, the British. And then the, this quite extraordinary process of um, nailing down the starting points of mapping within India, you know, this line of, of um, survey points up 
the middle of India and then branches coming off it across the Himalaya, which basically nailed down and fixed the starting points for the mapping of the whole subcontinent. A process that became not immediately redundant, but you really feel for them because it took years and years and several um, chiefs at the, at the Survey of India to get the project done with colossal casualties from all kinds of diseases and altitude and you know disaster and violence. But eventually they, they did this thing. And um, you know it was a, it was one of the great achievements of um, surveying in geographical history. Um, yeah, especially the time when uh, the pundits took those uh, rosaries and they were mapping in their minds. That was phenomenal, well, that, you know, like culturally speaking. That is another story in itself, and and um, uh, yeah, I, I I mean it is extraordinary the things that they did and the people they chose to do it. Um, you know that um, Edward Smythe, uh, Edward Smythe is, is is just the most fascinating character. You know he he features in Tom Brown's School Days. You know this novel. He's this colonial administrator who just has a passion for hunting. So he's 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 the education officer in in Garwal, and he's crossing. Um, sorry, he's the education officer in Kamo. And he's crossing the border and traveling all over Tibet quite illegally. So he has kind of deep knowledge of Tibet to the extent that when Sven Hayden starts traveling there and starts writing books about his travels and saying, I'm the first white man to go to X, you know, Smythe has usually been there before him, which is very annoying to Hayden, yeah. um, who falls out with the Royal Geographical Society about it, which is how ridiculous it all got, you know. Um, but no, Smythe, he just, you know, just knew the right people to, to do that job. And it's, you know, it's um, that Johar Valley, you know, you've got people who understand. I mean, that's the fascinating thing about the Himalaya. You have people who understand both sides, who whose identity is fluid. You, you know, you have gender fluidity, you have cultural fluidity. You know, you can be a bit more Tibetan on the Tibetan side of the border, and you can be a bit more sort of Hindu when you come down to the plains to trade. You know, you can you can change your clothes, you can change your spiritual feeling yeah. in order to in order to sort of boost your your success as a trader. Sherpas are the same. Sherpas were just as good at it. Even today, Ed, you know, even in present times where the institute was located earlier, uh, there was this group of um, you know, homes uh, behind where I stayed and they were colonial looking homes, Dhaji architecture. And the story turns out that they were built by the British. It was a hotel and uh, the hotel was called Plutonia. Uh, and uh, there was some problem with access and they had to abandon it. And who comes in? The Kampa traders, the itinerant <laughs> traders. And today they're settled there. So they've got these colonial homes with fireplaces, high ceilings. They're practicing Buddhism but they live in a yeah. village which is predominantly Hindu. So, <laughs> so it's amazing, you know, to see these all layers of interaction coming in, um, in uh, these mountains. And uh, yeah. it's, it's just so fascinating. It is. And it's, um, it's enriching, uh, both metaphorically and literally often. And um, this is the thing that uh, really disturbs me is, is, the kind of current political trend against that you right. know that that you have to be a certain way to be here mm -hmm. like i mean just on a, on an entertainment level it's really boring why would you want everybody to be the same i mean you 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 don't learn anything from that <laughs> you yeah. know, there's, nothing, there's nothing to say about it. it it's just stupid and yet um it's it's a great way to get elected isn't it i mean it's it's you you tell people that the things that you hold dear are under threat from people who don't value them in the same way that you do um and it's you know it's 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 in the last few in the last decade or so i rather suspect it's changing because it leads you down a dead end but um in the meantime we we lose a great deal i think and I think uh, uh, Siddharth would uh, concur with me, especially I keep talking about the Kulu Valley in particular, because that's where I've uh, 
been and seen so many yeah, things, developments. Yeah, but, oh. Um, oh, somebody's speaker is on, yeah. I think. Um, just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's Rina. speaker is, yeah. Rina's speaker is on. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I've muted her. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. So, um, you know, even with the uh, gurus, the gurus are the spokespersons of the gods. And this, this has been a tradition in the Himalaya, where even in Uttarakhand, where you've got the... Um, um, uh, these specific people who get um, uh, uh, transpossessed or um, they speak on the behalf of the gods or what's happening, even in Kulu Valley it happens. And it's almost like some of these people are being used by political uh, parties to, um, you know, when you're talking about they want everything to be the same, they want people to vote for them, you know, the Congress or the BJP. And these elements that are age old are getting used uh, by these people to say a certain things to have people in this way and how religion is used uh, it's it's really sad how it is used to kind of redirect political it is. i mean i would say i would say though that it that's always been the case if if you think about i mean i can think of several examples i mean there's that example you know there are examples in the second diffusion of buddhism you know a thousand years ago where you have where you have kind of proper Buddhists, if you like, taking on magicians. And when you dig a little bit deeper into those confrontations, you discover that the magicians are kind of anti the regime, <laughs> who Tibetan Buddhists are pro the regime. Now, you could argue that the wisdom coming out of that second diffusion was probably more worthwhile in terms of like a cultural future than, you know, the 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 older kind of um magical tricks if you like that were being uh uh, uh kind of exposed or you know the nechung oracle in Lhasa, which was pretty much invented to give a kind of um spiritual gloss on political decisions so by the by the great fifth you know the, the fifth dalai lama who who kind of established that that system of government um, which dominated um, Tibet for the centuries after, in 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 um, in the late seventeenth and uh, into the eighteenth century, and then onwards. Um, you know, would, if if you if we're not sure about something, we'll go and ask the Nechung Oracle, and you know the skullduggery that has gone on in within Tibetan Buddhism mm -hmm. in organizing the right political outcome outcome from a spiritual question is you know well it's endless. But um, I think I think the problem with using it now is is one of nationalism, because you know nationalism is the thing that's new. I mean, there was no sense when that was happening in Western Tibet a thousand years ago, or in in Lhasa five hundred years ago, of nationalism. It was a way of of negotiating very, very complicated kind of, you know, um, uh, conflicts and resentments and um, keeping a balance. But what it wasn't was about preserving the borders of a, of, of, of a nation. And, and that's, that's where I think it becomes problematic because, you know, with, 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 a, with nationalism, what are you buying into? You know, what's the big central story? It was very clear to people in Lhasa four or 500 years ago, what it was they were buying into. They were buying into their identity as Tibetan Buddhists. Now, when you do that, you know, you're using a kind of Himalayan shaman to push a, 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 a Congress or, or BJP argument. It's about Delhi. It's got nothing to do with where, where you are in the Himalaya. It's to do with Delhi. It's to do with an agenda which is elsewhere. So that that I think is why it's problematic, and um, yeah. Thanks, Siddharth. Over to you. Thanks. Yeah, no, I mean this is such a what should I say? It's such a delicate, you know, um, line to follow, as it were, or to balance. I mean, it's so easy for us to fall to whip up irrational or completely false sentiments and. You said um, at, at the very beginning that we are now living with innumerable, I mean, possibly for the first time in human history with much more 
information but also many more forms of medias of technologies of so many things that all of these things are also sort of uh, you know collaborating together or are being used together by the powers that are in order to whip up a particular kind of a kind of a sentiment you know so it the, the sort of the the debate only keeps and and the these ideas only keep getting more and more complicated you know as so many factors factors come in so yeah. so so thank you for that on the other on the other hand i also understand that the need to preserve this sense of contradictoriness i mean how do you you know um how do you sort of maintain a balance for instance like for instance that famous uh, south uh, south indian philosopher uh, ak ramanujan has a famous essay on the 300 ramayanas which was taken off by uh, by the right wing regime a couple of years ago from a couple of universities because they did not want that thing to be circulated and yet it is very much common knowledge across the country that there is no one version of the ramayana or even if there is um, you know it has always undergone so many sort of transformations and all so how do you maintain that kind of a balance towards diversity and as well as a certain sort of predilection for your for your version what you like the most is a is a very tense question and obviously it is a politically related question as well and i don't know what is exactly the the solution for it but uh, but as you say what is happening currently is certainly not the way to go about uh, about mythology um now coming i wanted to come back to the to your book and um talk a little bit about and i think this will be uh, my probably my second last to last question wanted to talk about this the, the the craft of your writing i mean it is such an enormous book divided into 20 chapters and i kept you know thinking about what was that particular moment i guess first of all um in your career as a journalist and also as a mountaineer i guess when you decided to write something like this and how did you i mean was there any kind of a method in which you were sort of chipping away or trying to tell yourself no i won't include this thing but i will include this thing <laughs> each and every chapter is literally a thesis in itself you know and if we remove the word human and we say himalaya is a political history it would very much stand the same i mean the book you know so but i was and i could see that there are certain markers that you keep coming back to so for instance there is a lot of focus on tibet and around that nepal and chinese interactions mm-hmm. and then again towards the end you sort of go back to tibet because of your expertise but connected to these questions were there any and because this is a, i think a challenging question for any writer were there any points when there were these different voices in your head telling you but the focus should be also on this but the focus should be also on this or i can focus more on the western himalayas or i can focus more on the eastern himalayas i mean just the just the sense of how do you how did you grasp or come up with some sort of a craft of your own methodology that's what i would like to know more about no well you're right it was extremely difficult and actually i had to write another book before to teach me how to write this one if you see what i mean i i wrote a a, a thing about northern english history mm-hmm. which used it quite a similar approach but it's a much smaller book it's a much shorter book and um i literally did that in order to try and understand how i might do this because you're right it's extraordinarily difficult and um you and you're also right that that i tended to stick to to places and times and ideas that i was more comfortable or or more knowledgeable about personally and i also you're right that it's a political history really but i called it a human history because um i wanted the politics of the place to be the thing the people as soon as you call it a political history you start you know suddenly you're talking about nehru and mao and obviously these people are relevant but it's 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 the kind of uh, mountain culture and the politics that that produces that were of interest to me and I had a very clear idea of a very simple message which I I think I actually describe in the book of what I was writing about and it was this that the Himalaya was a region it was a space mm. and it was 
it has been compressed quite recently in its history into a line. And that has caused a lot of problems. Yeah. And if that is the take home of the book, then that's great because, you know, the other thing that I really wanted to get across, and I find this really moving actually, and it's very human. There was a British historian writing about um, the uh, Anglo-Nepali wars, war, who, who dismissed Himalayan trade as kind of not worth bothering with, you know, minor, Im unimportant. And yet Himalayan trade produced, you know, the temples in Kamandu and a great deal more besides. And it, it also produced, you know, a very, a, a great depth of, of Buddhist scholarship. And these are immense cultural legacies. I mean, huge on actually very good value for money, if you think about it, <laughs> because there wasn't a huge amount of money involved. But that just shows you the, you know, the ingenuity of the people that you're dealing with and, and the subtlety. Um, uh, it's, the British always miss subtlety in South Asia. You know, they, they did it, well, you know, we did it when we were in charge and we've done it since. You know, we don't understand what we don't understand, the scale of it. Yeah. And, um, and that's a very good example, I think, because... You know, you can you can think about tantra. We were just talking about you can think about that for years, and yet, you know, cons Western consumerist culture, you can think about it for about fifteen minutes. You know, it's like it's not actually that interesting. So, um, yeah, so that that th those were the principal things that I was trying to get across, and and I the only way you could do it, I have the same problem at the moment with the project I'm working on. Because, because you're trying to explain complexity, but you're also trying to provide a narrative that people can get through, um, the way that I'd, I'd try and do it is to go in very close at a very sp particular spot in time and place, and then fill it in in fine detail, and then pull back and link it in broad strokes to the next little scene that you're doing, and go in again in immense detail and then let your reader draw the conclusion which is that it's all like that but we don't have to read about it in quite such detail across the piece you just mm -hmm. get that impression i mean genuinely this you know i tried to write a book um that would let people in a little bit and then they could go on to to um you know to other yeah. writers who, who have more knowledge more you know more depth of knowledge and, and different perspectives. That's all. Absolutely. Thank you. This is yeah. really complex. Thank you. Yes, Sonali. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, we, we need to kind of, I really would like, you know, Ed, uh, you be a part of, you know, uh, what we do at Hicks and uh, what we are forming at CPS. We, we need a vocalization of, you know, all these aspects, the history, and what we, can we do to uh, save these uh, mountains, which, of course, it's almost like conquering them um, with these highways that are being built and what next, you know, we are just going there, reaching, now what? It's like the Himalayas are not formidable and there are these, uh, you know, channels of exchange and look what have we done with, you know, the recent tunnel that was built. Of course, development, mm -hmm. engineering, everything is there, accessibility, but it's changing. It's changing to its detriment as well. And what what can we do to help? And that becomes very challenging. And understanding the breadth of human history that you've written and as an archeologist, you know, learning from our mistakes and making sure we do not do any and we don't, having a voice in public policy making in countries in South Asia is so difficult as well. So I think if we all come together and we start talking and implementing things, you know, Siddharth is doing it as in his way, you're doing it in your own way and I, and I think that's the next chapter that we have to write, uh, the application of saving the Himalaya and making sure that we do everything. I don't know how we're doing, doing it. It's, it seems like humongous, but if in our own little islands, all of us who are gathered here today, try to make a difference, we can slowly and steadily, you know, uh, make changes. So I do want to ask you about uh, what do you think the future holds and how can we as individuals help? 
and we can then open the forum to questions. Uh, unless Siddharth, you have a question that you want to wind up with before that. But uh, let's open the, que uh, you know, audience, uh, they would have questions. So with your thoughts on the future of the Himalaya, and then let's open the forum for questions. Um, well, last year I, I was in uh, the region for the BBC doing a radio series on these issues. and. Um, and that was immensely enjoyable and also rather inspiring because you realize um, the depth of uh, kind of awareness and uh, knowledge amongst uh, people working in the region um, for these issues. You know, there's, there's an acute awareness amongst in academia and, and amongst NGOs about what's going on and lots of ideas about solutions. And there, there always are solutions, you know, because people are smart and they, you know, they, they can figure out how to do this. The difficulty comes with politics. And um, we were talking, you know, we talked a lot about the way um, uh, people get maneuvered um, in, in political debates. And let's think about what China does. China makes reality. It doesn't waste time, it starts pouring concrete or it starts building stuff. And that changes, you know, the place that they're dealing with. So they have um, transformed um, their parts of the Himalaya um, by basically spending a lot of money and getting on with it and not allowing anybody to get in the way. Uh, that has had some positive aspects in terms of economic growth, but it's also had some very negative ones in terms of like um, individual freedoms. And it's almost the opposite south of the Himalaya because people are free to speak their minds in a way that they're simply not in Tibet or in, you know, Sichuan, you know, in, in um, Yunnan, places like that. Um, and that has provided opportunities for uh, some rather cynical um, exploitation by politicians who benefit from large projects in terms of kickbacks and contracts and so forth. And local voices can be manipulated and avoided, you know, sort of ignored in, in terms of the impacts. So how you address that is, I think, extremely difficult. You, you see across the Himalaya, people saying, yeah, we need a road. You know that will change that will make our lives so much easier and often it does the exact opposite you know it it messes up water supply it you know persuades your youth to leave it it um causes landslides and um it ends up being quite a negative thing and the person who got the contract makes money and the politician who pushed for it to happen makes a bit of money but life has changed and the environment is spoiled and ultimately nobody gains. So I, I just think local political organization is, the, is, is absolutely key in um, having a, a kind of intelligent and informed and, and sustainable discussion about what happens next. Because, you know, change is inevitable. The self-sufficiency that so many Himalayan valleys had is over. And as much as I would like it not to be, I can also see why, because being a subsistence farmer is really hard. I would not wish that on anybody. And, um, but I am a trustee of a, of a NGO that works in Eastern Nepal, south of the Everest region. The Everest region is, is now the richest region in Nepal. And, um, um, and there are villages south of it where people are still astonishingly poor. And that, you know, that inequality of wealth is a big problem. And finding the right ways in those villages to create wealth um, and improve life uh, chances and is, 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 is a challenge, but it's doable. I mean, it's amazing to see, to go to a village, that kind of village 25 years ago, and think, wow, this is really tough. And then to go back to the same village and see, 
they've sorted out the water so you don't have to spend hours and hours collecting water they've got a little bit of electricity which is you know with led lights makes life a lot easier they've got a little bit of you know data from masts um and suddenly they've you know they, they're growing slightly different crops you know more cash crops more fruit and veg and it looks starts to look like a really really nice place to live um one of the things about British mountains that happened is they were depopulated. They, they emptied. You know, there were all kinds of ways of living in British mountains and they're gone. And they were covered in sheep. And they're now, cult they're now um, biodiversity deserts as a consequence. You know, there's no biodiversity there at all. I sincerely hope that does not happen to the Himalaya. And like huge projects, huge hydro projects timber, you know, um, exploitation, um, overgrazing, you know, capital intensification of agriculture. These are the big challenges, I think. Yeah. And just follow the money. Yeah. And because I think Ed, it'll be sorry. people from outside with a lot of money who will do this. And I think, Ed, uh, you know, the silver lining is in these little things that we are able to do as individuals. And I want to uh, narrate this uh, thing during the pandemic. You know, there's this little village in Kulu. Um, um, it's called the Shal. And uh, the headmen there, you know, they were planning to, uh, th there's like this enchanted forest that I call, it reminds me of Enid Blyton's The Enchanted Forest. <laughs> that was a book that I loved when I was a kid. And I, I used to go there for walks and uh, there's this bridge which was in a very dilapidated condition. And I said, oh, so what are you doing about this bridge? They said, oh, we are going to make a steel bridge here. It'll be sturdy and it'll be strong. And my heart broke. And I was like, you know, this forest won't look like it and they, they're going to pave it and they're going to just spoil it. So anyway, I, I, I kept interacting with them. And, and this was last year. My mother has just passed. And this was the first thing after her passing that brought a smile to my face. I got a photograph from the village headman who had made a wooden bridge instead of the steel, uh -huh. uh, the iron one and said that we decided to go your way. And I loved that because it was uh -huh. a gesture that was so small in a little village building something which is wooden versus iron so that it doesn't spoil the, you know, the, the, the feel of the place. And it keeps the integrity and the significance of the place alive. And I think little, yeah. you know, little building on larger things like hydropower projects and this and that, of course, those are so important. But it has to start with the individual in these little villages where we come yeah. not as change makers, but uh, tell them the worth of, you know, how mixing the modern and the, uh, the ancient comes together in a way that is, uh, uh, modern in its truest sense, in the sense of thinking, in the sense of living, but not just saying, oh, you guys don't know anything. We are the ones who will guide you. You know, that kind of yes. attitude that we come with also has to change neutrality and truly understanding who these people are. They, they love their culture. They love their heritage. They love their wooden temples and their wooden homes. But how do they build it? The, the problem is survival as well. It's economy. And you so brilliantly explain all of these uh, tangents that we have to cover. So um, that's my take on it. And I, I just thank you so much for this wonderful book that you've given to the world. And we can connect with it and build our own trajectories, which help us in saving the Himalaya. Uh, Siddharth? No, thank, thank you. you. I mean, this is such a lovely example that uh, Sonali uh, took, and I think it's always nice to conclude with the symbol of, uh, of a bridge, I guess, because it is it is uh -huh. so potent, uh, and also because it connects to your book. Actually, uh, you do refer just in a line somewhere in the early chapters that there was a time that Himalayas were very famous for for their bridge makers, right? Absolutely. You said this also because of the great rivers that were there. So the always the challenge was that. Uh, and you make this point quite explicitly that it's not necessarily the the mount the materiality of the mountain itself, but actually the rivers uh, that have been the source of yeah. all the systems there, and also how to cross those rivers. They they had to come up with some ingenious indigenous techniques of building bridges, 
which is what led to their fame as well. So in a way, Sonali's comment actually gets connected to your to your book, and yeah. I I too thank you so much for 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 this wonderful endeavor, and I look forward to reading more of your work and have more conversations. Thank you. I'm a, I look forward to your book. I'll immediately go and look for it. <laughs> I will, I will write to you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I would like to urge all the audience, if you have questions, now is your time. You can raise your hands and ask Ed all that you want to know about the Himalaya. Yeah. So Abhimanyu has a question. Abhimanyu, over to you. Uh, hi, Ed. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. And uh, I actually had a bit of a different opinion on mountain roads. I do my PhD in on roads in the Himalayas. And as you rightly pointed out, it's very often the case in the recent decades that the local communities themselves, they ask for roads, like it's often their number one demand from governments that they want roads. Yeah. I agree with you on the point they often cause, they usually cause a lot of environmental disturbance and destruction. Yeah. They bring in the politics of money and connect these places to different markets, which reduce local self-sufficiency and they cause what we might call the deterioration of the cultural aesthetic in the Himalayas. But at the same time, I do feel also that uh, I would play the devil's advocate where it comes to roads with the Himalayas. I feel today it is actually their number one need as well. In the yeah. time of uh, when the Himalayas are also like, as you began your uh, talk with, the Himalayas are not something separate out there kind of place. They are connected to everything else that happens in the world also, right? So in the times of neoliberalization, in the times of growing national boundaries, hardening national boundaries, in the times of climate change, the kinds of opportunities and solutions that uh, people can have require good access, require good connectivity. You know, so roads are central to that in the Himalayas, I believe. Yeah? Like for example, in the Spiti Valley, in the Indian Trans Himalaya, south of Ladakh, where I do my PhD, their roads have single-handedly uplifted almost the entire society out of what might be called uh, poverty. There is hardly any poverty in Spiti, you know, because mm. of the cash crop agriculture that came about there in the 1990s. And yeah. a number of households have also grown uh, fairly well off due to their engagement with tourism. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. That is there. Yeah. So, and at the same time, the coming of roads to these parts has also brought about a Buddhist revival in Spiti. Yeah. You know, like, for example, in the 1960s, 50s, and 60s, the Dalai Lama, with all his uh, senior lamas, they went out of Tibet, came to India. Till that point of time, Spiti was something like a cultural backwater in the Himalayas, you know. But when the Dalai Lama came to Spiti in 1983 and before him, there was another Rinpoche that came in the 19, late 60s, 70s. These people, they harbingered and, and they could only come because of roads. They didn't come by helicopter or anything, you know. Yeah, yeah. So they started an entire Buddhist revival in Spiti. So for them, even their, for them, culture is not deteriorating because of roads. It actually kind of is. Yes. No, you're quite right. And I, I, I would, um, I would uh, slightly... Uh... Uh, I mean, I, you, you, you're absolutely right. I, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. I was thinking particularly uh, in those comments in what's happening in uh, the middle hills of Nepal at the moment, um, because um, the scale of road building that's going on, of essentially unengineered roads, to, you know, roads done with a with a JCB and very little else. Um, that's what I had in my mind because that their roads which won't last and are causing a great deal of damage and aren't properly engineered, aren't properly surveyed, and the impact on the things that I talked about uh, have been very negative. Um, um, but, but why should the people of the Himalaya be denied the connectivity that we enjoy? I mean, you, you make a very good point. And if you're going to have cash crops, then you're going to need access to markets. And if you don't have that, then it won't work. So, of course, you do need roads. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with you. I mean, on a human level, I kind of mourn the passing of the remoteness of the places that I visited. But like I said at the start, it's not my place. 
you know, it's the it's the, the people to ask are the people who live there and they can make those decisions. Um, and you're, you're, you know, you're absolutely right about Smithy, you know, that um, uh, the Dalai Lama's presence in India um, has reinvigorated, reinvigorated some of the corners of India where perhaps Buddhism had faded from view and, and, and the access to those places has lifted them up too. I mean, I would say that, you know, part of India's problems in Ladakh have been from a lack of infrastructure and that um, if more investment was made in infrastructure, um, as the Chinese wouldn't have felt quite so emboldened to absorb more of it. So, um, in, you know, you're, you're right about Spiti I, I, and there are other parts of uh, the Indian Himalaya which have benefited greatly from infrastructure, but um, it's unevenly spread as well, I would say. And I would say that it's like, the problem is not the roads, the problem is this unbridled tourism that is haphazard and uh, there is no you know uh, like the houses are just concrete like there's no idea of uh, identity and like what you said ed everything is becoming like what do we learn from having everything the same way like, where, where will the individuality go no, 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 I'm sorry. I, I should have said something uh, uh, briefly about um um about architectural heritage yeah uh, in, in in britain we have national parks. The only reason that they're accepted by the UN as national parks is because of their cultural heritage, not because of nature. If you took away all our national parks, wouldn't make any difference to biodiversity at all. You would lose no species if you got rid of our national parks. But the human cultural heritage is immense. And there's a tremendous uh, interest and support for like that historical, for historical buildings, you know, for vernacular architecture. And one of, the, for me, one of the heartbreaking things about um, Himalaya is watching amazing old buildings being allowed to collapse and being replaced with, you know, that concrete pillar and shuttered, um, which you see, you know, right across the region. Um, and, and if, you know, if there was, you know, one thing I would say is, yeah, have your road, but have some pride in the in in the kind of architectural brilliance of your past. You know, keep some of that um, because it it will eventually be immensely valuable to you. That is what people want to see. Ultimately, they love that. They want to see that. It's worth saving for your community and also for your business. So um, I hope there's more of that. Um, I've seen examples, lots of examples across the Himalaya where that's worked extremely well. And I, and I hope that there's more of that in the future. Like your bridge. I just have one full question associated, if I may. This oh, sure. is actually related, uh, sir, to your point about tourism uh, uh, and architecture. I would like to have your view on the policy of Bhutan, you know, on tourism, on capping tourism numbers and also on preserving things like architecture and the look and stuff like that. What would you say? Well, um, I have a particular difficulty with Bhutan because of its recent history. Um, so it always pains me to say nice things about Bhutan because I spent a lot of time in refugee camps in eastern Nepal. and. Um, um, and the cynicism of that policy is, is quite hard to swallow, you know. On the other hand, they know what they've got. Um, I, I think, you know, the gross domestic happiness stuff that the BBC loves is, it might provoke some cynicism, <laughs> but, um, but you can't fault their business model in that sense. Um, Nepal has given it away too cheaply in in many, many cases and overdeveloped. You know, I've seen places like Pokhara become uh, destroyed I mean, it's appeal destroyed um, as a consequence of overdevelopment. Um, on the other hand, Nepal does, you know, has done some things extremely well. And um, in, in the long run, that's the way to go. Tourism is very difficult. It, it's not just difficult in the Himalaya, it's a difficult, ask people in Venice, you know, what they think of tourism or Barcelona. You know, it's it's the same deal. Uh, it's hard to manage. You you have the additional challenges of uh, pilgrim tourism, um, which is immense business 
and often more damaging than far more damaging than adventure tourism you know trekking and mountaineering and so forth you see endless stories about the litter on everest everest is actually quite clean in comparison to somewhere like kailash where the garbage is absolutely appalling um it's again it's political will you know if I mean, garbage is ultimately quite a small problem, but 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 overdevelopment of villages, you know, with the wrong kind of architecture is is a real issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, we need yeah. some resource management, cultural resource management, and the well, it, you have to think about you know. So often, um, tourism businesses end up being owned by people outside of the region. Exactly. Employing people from outside of the region in buildings that are from outside of the region. None of that is good for local communities. I, you know, I, I've seen lots of great homestay projects. You know, I, I, I mean, I went through one through the Marka Valley with my kids. I took my kids through a homestay project in the Marka Valley in Ladakh, which was fantastic. It was brilliant. You know, sitting in a Himalayan kitchen is one of the great pleasures in life. <laughs> and that's somewhere you can do that. And, 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 and it was such a special experience which they've never forgotten, you know, they loved it. Um, so, you know, that's, mass tourism is appealing because it's numbers and there's more money, but um, I know which is a better experience as a tourist, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ed. I mean, sorry, sorry to just, you know, butt in, but I just want to say that uh, that's, this is also one of the reasons why I enjoyed your section on Nevari architecture so much, because you were able to think about, you know, and uh, you have the, introduction on what Nevari architecture is and you know how it gets sort of connected to the local mythology of Nepal as well. So that was absolutely wonderful. And as someone, I mean, I, I architectural research is one of my big passions. And as someone who has been researching that in the context of the Shimla Hills, one of the things that I keep thinking about uh, and talking about in, in the context of Himalayan architecture is that it is one of the best examples of how form and function meet together. I mean, it's just remarkable that there is no, it's not just aesthetically pleasing, but because it originates from the land and the landscape itself, does yes. it in a way go back to the landscape? It is not something antithetical to, to the landscape. And that is why, in fact, if you think about the, the, the sort of, you know, the romanticized images of, or, but, but, to a certain level, quite genuine images of Kulu or Shimla or other parts of Himachal or other parts of the Himalayas. The, we, we will never, you're right, we don't associate the, the concrete RCC architecture that has come to now dominate the entire course of not only the Himalayas, but South Asia in, in general. And it's literally, lit, literally the same. It's literally everywhere. Like even in Kulu, it is the same. Everywhere it is the same. Oh. So it's oh. just, it's, it's horrible and horrifying. But you're right. That's what strikes the viewer and the visitor first and foremost when they visit the Himalayas. Yeah, and and I do I do hope like you know uh, we are we are making um, plans of projects which are going to kind of um, um, we want to change the mindset. Um, and we're going to do it slowly, like, you know, with the work that I do here in Southern California is all about significance of architecture and how to mitigate, uh, you know, uh, problems that arise to make sure that the historicity is not affected. And that will be um, my goal uh, where I work as well in my own little, you know, whatever you may call it, island, <laughs> or where I kind of, uh, you know, uh, apply what I'm learning. And I think each one of us needs to do that as well in, you know, what we are doing. And let's uh, um, uh, take the question to Midhavi. Midhavi, your question. Hi, thanks, Sonali. And thank you, Where It's always wonderful to learn more from your work and to finally li listen to you. Um, considering that uh, global warming is impacting our environment. How do you think mountaineering will change in uh, the next two or three de de decades? Most of the Sherpas have voiced their concern. And, uh, uh, you know, like, for example, Everest is now warmer and there is less snow now. Base camp, it's easier to stay on the base camp now. So how do you think the vocation will also change in the next 20 to 30 years? Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I am I am still a mountaineer, and um, um, we within our community uh, we have a great deal of um, discussion about all of this about the morality of climbing in this um, period. Uh, you know, should we be flying in there in the first place? Um, the Sherpas are right to be concerned about the loss of ice, but that hasn't stopped the use of helicopters mushrooming in the last few years. Um, you know, because it suits them to do that. <laughs> they don't want their clients to stop coming because their business will stop. So that is a big conundrum for, for the mountaineering world. Um, I always think of us as the canaries in the mine, you know, because we've we've experienced this for decades now, this loss of ice. I mean, I, mean, I know glaciers in the Alps where I went as, I started in the Alps when I was 17 and I'm now 57, so that's 40 years ago. And we've watched them disappear. It's absolutely staggering. It has made the mountains more dangerous. Um, I used to climb in the Alps in July. I would not go there in July now. It's too dangerous uh, because of rockfall. Uh, it's changing permafrost within the mountains, um, uh, which has made them more dangerous. And um, yeah, it is absolutely staggering to see. In terms of the Himalaya, um, I mean, tourism is one part of it. Um, you know, the, the loss of glacial ice is going to have a big impact on people. Uh, it's gonna have, a, you know, on, on irrigation farming, it's gonna have a big impact. You know, the threats of um, glacial lake outbursts um, and on. Um, the, the mountains are gonna be browner, they're gonna be darker. Um, it, it it's very difficult to see. What I would say is that um, the region's voice um, in terms of the climate change debate has to be heard more loudly. I don't know if you know about ISIMOD, um, uh, the ISIMOD, um, which has done a pretty good job. I saw that I was at um, COP26 in Glasgow uh, the year before last. Um, and Isamod were very present in trying to make that debate. But mountains are the kind of poor cousin of, of, of the environmental movement. Um, you know, we hear about rainforests, we hear about rivers, we, you know, we hear about forests, um, but not so much about the mountains. And um, the impact that climate change is having in the Himalayas is, is, is obvious and uh, ex quite extreme. And... Um, I don't know what to say about it because, it, it, you know, I, I'm, it's not that I'm pessimistic. It's just so far there's not been a huge amount of evidence that the world is changing. Um, you know, hydrocarbons still, you know, right, 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 right the agenda, which is the problem. Yeah. And how it's affecting even um, Malana cream for that matter. You know, it's going into higher altitude. Um, Apple is going to higher altitude because uh, things yes. are changing. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and you will lose species as well. Uh, you know, altitude is like latitude. And, you know, there, there, there are species we're already losing in the UK because they can't survive in the heat um, disappearing off the tops of mountains. Our mountains are much smaller, of course. So mm -hmm. it's a big mm -hmm. problem. But, uh, but yes, the, the environmental impact of this is... Um, I think, to be honest, habitat loss is something that will drive that more than climate change, to be blunt. Yeah. Um, but the, bio, the biodiversity crisis is even less discussed than, uh, well, is less discussed than climate change. We're all aware of climate change. Biodiversity loss is a real issue. And the Himalaya is a biodiversity hotspot. And that, I think, is really worth defending. I talked about how British mountains are you know, um, without biodiversity, lacking in biodiversity. We are one of the most nature deprived countries in the world mm -hmm. um, because we didn't take this seriously. Um, and I, I would urge everybody in the Himalayan region to take their nature seriously because it's stunning and worth keeping. Abhimanyu, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Ed, sir, uh, for this uh, nice insight on climate change in the Himalayas. 
my question is something of a bit more uh, immediate human scale uh, it's about like you've written this book now on the entire himalayan region and you were forced to travel all throughout uh, do you feel there is like it's often something of a stereotype at least in india and also somewhat in nepal that when people when you go from the plains to the mountains then there is a noticeable shift in the kind of feeling you get from being among the people there you know that the mountain people are more warm they are more kind they are more honest they are more kind of peaceful not so aggressive what has your experience been uh, i mean i know it's like a very generalized kind of a question but have you come yeah. across that kind of an experience more often than not well bluntly yes uh, i thought it thought about this a lot over the years whether i'm just being naive or romantic or i think there are things about mountain culture which uh, um bring out the advantages of cooperation i've noticed this in gender relations so well, i think women by and large have an easier time of it a bit in the mountains than they do on the plains for instance um that's not always the case but because um it's harder it's more difficult and you have to there isn't the uh surplus required to be um to to like shut people out plus also people in the mountains are often traders and they're often meeting people um in from other cultures and also they're often at a disadvantage um and and it it makes more sense to be amenable than it does to be aggressive do you see what i mean so i think there are practical reasons for that mm-hmm. i don't think one group of people is necessarily nicer than another group of people i think that they have to just rely on different strategies in order to get through the day it, it, does that sound cynical i don't i don't mean it to i i mean i do like the way mountains bring out the better angels of our natures <laughs> but i don't i don't i would re- resist the idea that mountain people are necessarily nicer or better or more moral or anything like that i just think they have different circumstances um what i do like what i do like about mountain people is that they're often very self-reliant because they have to be you know often they're ignored by by cities on the plains they have to rely on themselves they they're living in a physically demanding situation and they have to be quite resourceful to deal with that and um it's just me you know that's why I'm a climber <laughs> i like that so I, that appeals to me but um i i i don't see any great moral uh superiority i i i just see people with a whole different set of challenges to deal with thank you so much sir Thank you Ed and uh, we won't uh, trouble you with uh, more questions let's take the last few uh, we have our research scholar here uh, Rajoli Ghosh who has a question for you Rajoli over to you Good evening sir it was wonderful listening to your talk and uh, you touched upon so many dimensions and tangent uh, that made me think about certain things and I'm willing to learn more about it uh so during this discussion you mentioned that uh, in himalayas people are more uh, self uh, sufficient so i would like to know uh, how do you think they are more uh, self uh, sufficient and uh, what is it that is you know making it go uh, uh, disappear like how are things changing and uh, if you could elaborate a bit more on that well i'll tell you a story as, as an answer um Uh, in recent years i spent a lot of time in humla i've already mentioned humla um but i i've been doing a lot of exploratory mountaineering up there uh, because um that's where the unclimbed mountains are there are lots and lots of mountains over 6000 meters that haven't been climbed yet and um forgive me but that's appealing to me and so that's why i go to humla a lot and uh, uh, two or three years ago three or four years ago now before the pandemic anyway I was up very early in the morning in the village and I was chatting with a guy and then I noticed a long line of people an old guy like a guy in his like 60s 
and um, I noticed a long line of people queuing outside a, a, a village, you know, an official building, a local authority building in the village. And I said, like, what are they waiting for? You know, thinking it was like, I don't, I don't know what I thought it was. He said, oh, rice. Well, they're waiting for rice. And I yeah. said, you grow rice up here? What's the problem? He said, um, people have stopped. This is rice from the government. And he right. just shook his head. You know, he said, we used to grow our own rice. It was, and to be honest, this rice is shit. <laughs> you know, the rice is not good, but it's, you know, cheap. And people don't have to grow their own rice anymore. And um, he, he said, uh, you know, it was a great, it was a sense of shame for him that this, this had happened. You know, this handout of rice. Now, you can grow rice a lot more efficiently in other, pla in, in other places. And, and, and that's a legitimate thing to do because like I said before, I wouldn't wish on anyone being a subsistence farmer. But the self-reliance bit is that if nobody is coming to help you, you're, you either fix yourself or you're finished. Yeah. And that has been the case for centuries in, in the Himalaya. Um, people have had to rely on their own resources because the safety net was not there. And, um, and that has made them resourceful as a consequence. And that is, that is going. Um, there will be losses in that as well as gains. You know, Humla is now growing lots of apples <laughs> yeah. and making money out of it. That's great. You know, that's a really good thing. So it's not like they've stopped growing things. It's just that those old patterns have broken down. And in the process, um, there are, you know, things have gone by the wayside, which are of regret to older generations. It's very hard though, you know, in Simicot, there are no roads. There are still no roads to joining it up to the road network. That will change and that's a good thing. But what they do have is the internet and you can sit on with your smartphone in a place with no roads, looking at the outside world and everything that it has to offer. That is a psychologically a huge distraction, I think. Before people got up, had a cup of tea, went into the fields, you know, while it was still cool, worked, came back, had dalbat, went out to the fields, worked, came home, had dalbat, went to bed. Never occurred to them that there might be something better. And now you have the whole world at your fingertips. I don't want to add, I don't want to add uh, so, uh, Charlie, I just want to add something. Um, um, you know, in my interactions with the spokesperson of the gods, you know, um, uh, one of them said that, uh, the god was, um, you know, in the channel, these energies, they say, I keep telling them not to grow apples. I keep telling them not to grow this. Uh, I tell them to grow red rice, but they don't listen to me. They want me to adapt yeah. to them. You know, yeah. I'm telling yeah. them to adapt because things are changing and there'll be a time when we will leave you all. And they just think that it's <laughs> not. This is, this is what they say in the interactions when the uh, spokespersons of the gods are called. And it is like mm. that. They are pressing issues that, oh, we need this. We need this land for apple cultivation. There'll be more, okay, you're you're making me, uh, you know, change. Like you're not growing what I want you to grow, the grains that I want you to grow. So there is this tussle going on even between the people and the mm. spokesperson of the gods, which is quite interesting, you know, to see at that level. That's super interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. And of course, you can grow, uh, you know, kinds of rice in the mountains, which you struggle with in the plains which are of immense value and and um maybe the rush to apples is um not that smart i don't know exactly yeah yeah it's fast money but over time it's going to be uh, uh devastating with the uh, yeah. yeah yeah so uh rajori you want to continue with what you wanted to ask uh, yeah, so I just wanted to um, thank him for the answer and also uh, that, you know, how in Kulu, I have been studying about traditional crop systems and we've actually uh, interviewed people and we've asked them about red rice and how the culture actually has been receding of growing their own uh, crops. So uh, I was actually happy that, you know, we had the same sort of um, uh notion and and the research that i was also doing so yeah so I well, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm actually much more interested in what you're saying than what i was saying <laughs> you you know about it but i mean that 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 i think is um i think that's right you know i mean um 
uh, the, it's it's intoxicating, isn't it? The new is is always very appealing. You 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 understand your world very well, and the new can be yeah. Let's let's go and do this. We'll make more money, and it'll be easier, and so on and so forth, without quite appreciating it is what it is that you have. Right. And then it also makes me think and come back to the whole point of like, you know, how road, uh, which is going into these villages and connecting them to the outer world is also, you know, in a way, uh, taking away their traditional knowledge and uh, their traditional life, which is also vanishing. So with new changes that are coming up, the past, the history that one held on to very closely and thought of their uh, of it as their own culture is actually uh, uh, evaporating into thin air. Yeah, that's very so, difficult. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could right. say that it's going to be fine, but I'm not sure. You know, um, throughout Europe, mountain regions have been depopulated. In Italy, in Spain, you know, people just left. There, you know, there are ghost villages. Yeah. In, in, in the mountains of Spain and in Italy, where, where right. nobody lives anymore, very few families. So we you, we haven't figured it out. So um, this process is newer in the in the Himalaya, but but um, but it's the same problem. You know, these are hard lives, and right. um, that's, you're going to need an awful lot of self-respect to make up for the <laughs> lack of resource. So uh, I. I you know, like I said, it's not my place. I'm, I'm not going to tell people how they should live. Um, but by the same token, I do think that there's a great deal of value in the cultures that these places made and that that should be honoured and preserved if possible. And uh, uh, just like, uh, you know, in the Khyber Pass and the Pakhtunwa area, you had this whole thing called the Kissa Khwani Bazaar. Uh, which I I totally, you know, love the idea of people congregating in a bazaar, talking about these faraway stories, you know, those mythical yeah. lands. And I would like to have Himalaya continue on that, the mythical uh, lands, yes. which even with, you know, this booming knowledge that we have on Google and all of that, we're able to tell these personal personalized stories of triumph, of navigating life in the mountains and uh, seeing it through the lens of people who experienced the Himalaya, our own Kisakwani Bazaar on Zoom. And I, I, I intend, uh, you know, doing that, um, you know, with even in the village with uh, local uh, uh, wise men or people who may not be literate like us, but have these amazing bonds with uh, stories, with their deities, with their landscape. And they come to the fore and talk about these things. And Ed, I invite you to our institute at Dhami whenever you wish to come, be our guest. We would love conversations like this. We want you to be a part of all of this. And we are Thank so you. happy to have you here. So as a parting, it. yeah, as a parting note, I I we, we always part with saying words of wisdom. So uh, you know, Siddharth and I together would urge you to leave us with a message. Uh, words of wisdom that we all can ruminate on and uh, you know do something for the Himalaya uh, well you have a Himalayan sized problem <laughs> um, and, uh, honestly when you climb mountains you don't think about the top you don't think about the finish you just think about the next step and then the next step and then the next step because otherwise you'd give up because it's hard so one step at a time and don't think too much about finishing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed. It's been such a pleasure. And we hope you come back again. Uh, truly, yeah. I absolutely love your book. Uh, and I do want uh, to announce that next week we have Kevin Dubrisky. Uh, he will Oof. be talking about uh, a photographer's journey, half a century journey around Nepal. And we are very happy, Ke Kevin, you're here right now. Uh, and oh, wow. Will... Yeah. I, 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 must, I must try and watch that. I would love to see that. I love Kevin's work. Yes. And Ed, if you want, we can add you to the group. It's a non-chatter group, so there's no chatter going on, but you get to be updated about talks that you may feel inclined to attend because they're, the one commonality is Himalaya. So I can add you if you're on WhatsApp. I am. Yeah, please do. I'll, okay. send you, um, I'll send you my cell phone number and then you can do that. Yeah. Great, great. Siddharth, any parting words? Yes. Uh, no, no, I mean, just uh, such a huge privilege. Uh, and, and as 
anyone researching the himalayas and anyone in love with the himalayas knows that these conversations are never ending and we can keep <laughs> keep talking about more and more and more episodes anecdotes analysis everything and they will never end and i think that's the joy of researching the himalayas as well so thank you thank you for your magnificent magnum opus as i would call it yes. it is a an incredible incredible work and i would strongly recommend it to everyone and i will be going back to it again and again for my own work and i hope that i can i mean you won't mind me writing to you and being oh, in conversation sure. please do yeah that's always a pleasure thank you and thank again you so this much. is the thank book so this is the book you can see it like upside down mirrored image uh, himalaya a human history please get it and uh, learn about ed douglas's journey with his trip with the mountains so <laughs> all of you have a wonderful evening day and night wherever you are thank you for being here dedicating your saturday to us at the himalayan institute of cultural and heritage studies follow us on instagram social media everywhere but do make a difference in the himalayas wherever you are so over and out <laughs> bye bye, bye. bye. thanks mali thank you thank you thank you thank you bye